In today's video, I'm going to show you how I installed the skirting boards in this bedroom last week. Now, this is a funny old area of DIY in the sense that there's no right way to do this. And how you install yours will depend very much on the type of skirting boards you've got and the type of walls you're fixing them to. So today's video is my take on installing skirting boards based on a number of years experience installing skirting boards around this old cottage. And I'll do my best as I go along to show you all the different techniques that there are which might apply better to your situation. Today's video is divided up into five areas. Setup and tools, whether you should use wood or MDF, the method of fixing the skirting board, how to deal with corners, and a bit of a discussion on scribing skirting boards around things like uneven floors. So let's have a quick look at the setup. I've got my battered old Black & Decker workbench, which I tend to use for all my cutting. I then combine that with saw horses to support the material that I'm cutting. Can't re recommend these things highly enough. And you may have seen my video a year or two back where I combined these saw horses to make a fantastic DIY workbench. You can get the version featured in today's video for $49.99 from Screwfix or a lighter weight version for £19.99 and that's for a pair. We're going to be cutting some 45 degree angles today so I'll be showing you this mitre box I made a couple of years ago. But if you can get hold of a mitre saw it will make your life so much easier and actually the price of some of them might surprise you. And the other option which I almost forgot about today, a circular saw. Moving on to tools, I recommend this Irwin Jack floorboard saw as you get a really precise cut with its finer teeth. And it's also good for mitre boxes. My other general saw is this Irwin Jack Universal, which would also serve you pretty well. I'll be using a coping saw to cut the corners of the skirting board, but we'll be discussing the pros and cons of this technique as against using a sliding mitre saw or a mitre box, which also comes in handy for joining skirting boards midway along the wall. It's a good idea to seal any gaps between the wall and the floor, particularly if you've just installed insulated plasterboard. So I'll quickly show you today how I use a combination of expanding foam tape and spray foam to eradicate any thermal bridges prior to installation. Today, I'll be mechanically fixing my skirting boards to the wall for reasons I'll explain shortly. And I'm using a new technique which minimizes the need for drilling and filling these lost tight screws and a two and a half millimeter diameter HSS drill bit to pilot the skirting boards and in the same movement mark exactly the position on the wall where we need to drill for the wall plugs. And these six millimeter diameter wall plugs worked really well with the lost tight screws. This bag of glazing packers often comes in handy and today I'm using the one millimeter version to create a slight space between the skirting board and the floor so that I can protect the floor when painting the skirting boards. If we were going to glue the skirting board, you'd want a grab adhesive like one of these, and I do in fact use my glue gun for one section of the wall. I bought this vintage block plane on the advice of my carpenter mate. I'll be using it today in conjunction with the scribing. I wouldn't be without this fantastic little tool. You'll need some sandpaper, and I find this oaky to be very durable and to clog a lot less than some brands. And finally, the two-part wood filler to fill the pinholes left by the screws. I've lost count of how many tins of this I've got through over the years. Available in two main colours, white and pine, to match the materials you're filling, though if you're painting, the colour obviously isn't a problem. And speaking of painting, I primed the underside of the skirting boards before fitting them to the wall with my favourite primer, Zinza BIN. Should we be using natural wood or MDF for our skirtings? Well, this is a tricky one, as I said at the start. Highly motivated by personal preference, but there are a few influencing factors to consider. My local timber merchants, I always try and buy from the independents where I can, stock 18mm by 119mm primed Taurus MDF for £2.81 a metre, or the deeper version 144mm for £3.36. Whereas the pine that I had decided to go for, these must be the pre-plane dimensions because my pine is actually 20 millimetres by 166, it was 30 pence a metre cheaper than the narrower MDF. So I went for this and combined it with the 68 by 20 millimeter OG architrave, which is a fairly classic combination. But was I right to plump for natural wood over MDF for these skirting boards? Well, I always find pre-primed MDF, like my window boards here, to be a little bit rough where it's been tooled and to require a little bit of sanding. And with MDF, I always worry about using it in rooms that have a susceptibility to damp. And I also worry about dents and scratches from vacuums and the like. Pine also has its vulnerabilities, owing in part to this annoying habit they have of making it double-sided. 
I've actually had carpet fitters breaking the skirting board before with this vulnerable OG on the underside. But my main issue with this skirting board is the ridiculous amount of warping that's happened since I got it back. Obviously, as you can see here, it's nice and true in the cold, dry environment in the warehouse. But as soon as I got it back into a heated house, even though this room isn't heated, it warped ridiculously, both along its length, down its width, and also vertically. Now this warping has heavily influenced the way I've installed my skirtings and created some real problems, such as larger gaps than I would have liked between the skirting and the wall, a few massive headaches with cutting and joining skirtings at 45 degree angles midway down the walls, which won't be square if like here, your piece of skirting isn't flat on the saw bed when you make the cut, and also butting up boards at the internal and external corners. So on my next project, I'll almost certainly be using MDF. Okay, we're on to step three. Should we be screwing or nailing the skirtings, gluing them, or perhaps a combination of the two? The right answer to this depends on what tools you've got available and what walls you're attaching the skirting boards to. Generally in the past, because of the uneven nature of my old Victorian brick walls, I've tended to screw the skirting boards to the wall. A carpenter mate of mine, particularly on new builds, uses a pin gun with 40 or 50 millimeter nails combined with glue. And there's a pretty good reason for that, because if you look at the tubes of grab adhesive themselves, they'll tell you that where you're fixing vertical applications like skirting boards, you need to temporarily hold the skirting boards in place while the glue sets. And whilst with typical grab adhesive like this, this can take anything up to 24 hours, it makes sense to use an element of mechanical fixing, whether that's nails or screws, to hold those skirting boards in place whilst they're setting. The exception is glue guns like this, which have a 48 second glue that goes off in a total time of five minutes. So obviously in that situation, you're holding the skirting board in place for a much shorter period of time. And I did experiment with this glue on a short section of skirting board, albeit backed up with the lost tight screws, because I don't have the luxury of relying on glue alone. But I've got to say the tack fix adhesive was holding pretty well before I put the screws in. But what do I think you should do? If your walls are completely flat and true and you can find a way to hold the skirtings in place while the glue's going off, I would be tempted to try and glue your skirting boards without any screws or nails. But for me, the screws are an extra insurance policy. A, because my skirting boards are so warped and B, because in this old cottage, the walls are not true. So I decided to screw my skirting boards to the wall and I thought if I'm gonna do that, there's no point gluing because once they're screwed in place, they're not gonna move, particularly with the cork along the top was this the right decision? Possibly not. Whilst the skirting board is holding in some areas, in others you can see a little bit of an evidence of movement, which of course isn't helped again by these unstable natural wood skirtings. You're not gonna have this problem with MDF. But I've obviously got large gaps and cork has a propensity to shrink anyway. But with the benefit of hindsight, what I probably should have done is glued at the very least the top section where you've got the decorative torus element to prevent the skirting board from moving. Installing skirting boards is a painstaking process. Screwing them to the wall is even worse. And when you have to fill the countersunk holes as I've done in the past after using eight by two inch or two and a half inch typical wood screws like this, it's sort of kicking you when you're down. So today, to minimize on the filling, I decided to use these lost tight screws with their ridiculously tiny screw heads, which are akin to a lost head nail or an oval nail. And also this threadless section with the secondary thread near the head itself does really help to pull the skirting board back towards the wall. Because the skeptics amongst you will say, ah, but you're not gonna get nearly as much pulling force of the skirting board back to the wall and you're of course right. But I think looking at these clips, you should be pretty impressed with the power of these tiny little screws. And let's face it, if you've got skirting boards that are as warped as I have, then you're really unlucky. For your typical MDF skirting boards with reasonably even walls and minimal points of springing, you're not gonna be so worried about pulling the skirting board back to the wall. So I urge you to give these little screws a go because they make the filling at the end of the job so much quicker. And as you saw earlier in the toolkit section, I used a two and a half millimeter HSS drill bit to mark the position on the wall that I then needed to drill with my larger six millimeter masonry drill bit for my red wall plugs. And the whole process was about as straightforward as it could have been. The only exception being for the exterior wall of the house, where I use these 
Fisher Duo Power 6x30s and a carefully marked drill bit so I didn't puncture through the vapour barrier on the back of the insulated plasterboard. And on this external wall I sealed the gap between the insulated plasterboard and the floor with this expanding foam tape, a link to a recent video on which is coming up on screen now. This stuff is great because unlike spray foam it's breathable whilst keeping water penetration out to 600 pascals of pressure while still eliminating thermal bridges and is obviously flexible. I ran out of the foam for the internal wall which still needed some insulation because of draft from the roof space so I used the more typical spray foam. I'm now going to show you two ways to approach your internal corners. Firstly this traditional approach which is the way I do all of mine. You start by marking the area you've got to cut on the back of the skirting because it's much easier and more accurate to trace the line of the skirting board on the back than on the decorative torus or OG front. For straight skirting boards this is a joy with wonky ones like this it's a little bit tricky because you've got to work out the angle of the wonky skirting board on the corresponding wall to the wall that you're scribing. You then make three cuts with your standard saw and then reach for your coping saw for the semicircular bit. This is a terrible coping saw, I bought it years ago and it's really flimsy. But it kind of does the job as long as you take your time and you don't rush. The clever thing about these saws, in case you didn't know, is that by unscrewing the handle you can change the direction of the blade so that the main body of the saw, this bit here, doesn't get in the way when you're sawing things like semicircles. Take your time with this because if you rush the blade will bend and the cut will not be accurate. Wooden spoon with a bit of 80 grit sandpaper. A little bit of fine tuning. And there we have it, one scribed corner piece. Other tools I sometimes use to help with the scribing process are my power file. And my old Bosch belt sander for fine tuning the cut so that the warped skirting boards can be buttered up to each other seamlessly. Now the second and by far the easiest option if you've got one is to use a sliding mitre saw. And mine has a single bevel which means you can tilt it to a 45 degree angle in just one direction in order to make your 45 degree mitre cuts. The more expensive mitre saws have a double bevel which means you can pivot them both ways. Now if you haven't got a mitre saw you can make your own mitre box like I've done here. I have tried to buy mitre boxes in the past like this Draper version here but I've found them being plastic to be quite flimsy and you've only got to make a few errant cuts into the factory cut on the box itself and then suddenly the mitre cuts that you're trying to make are no longer accurate. What do I say about this mitre box? Well it is hard work, I've done a demonstration for today's video, started with my Irwin floorboard saw which isn't really sharp enough so I reverted to my Irwin Jack universal saw where it was much easier. But overall they do a pretty good job and you can see how I've used it to good effect to make an external corner, albeit with smaller skirting boards because I made this mitre box for a previous project and the skirting boards I'm using today don't fit the box. And I nearly forgot to mention today my brilliant little circular saw which can also do cross cuts, 45 degree cuts and so much more. I've done a video on that and a link is coming up on the screen now. But with all these techniques available I'll still be sticking to traditional scribing on my internal corners. Why? Because you can do it with really simple tools, it's easier than using a mitre box and a lot of us don't have mitosaurs.
The second reason is with internal corners that aren't quite 90 degrees, it doesn't matter with this traditional technique, it still works. Whereas with the mitre saw, if the corners aren't 90 degrees and you don't set the angle properly, you're gonna be left with a gap. And the third reason, learning this traditional technique gives you the skill set to take on other intricate tasks. Like here, where I had to scribe my skirting into the architrave. But don't forget, where you're joining skirting boards mid-run across the room, it's a good idea to use a 45 degree cut. That way you can achieve an invisible join between the skirting boards. And for this you'll need to cut your 45 degree angle freehand with a mitre saw, mitre box or your circular saw, as I just demonstrated. Typical example here, where I had to slightly improvise again because of the warped skirting boards, this time with the lost tight screws coming to the rescue. Okay, we're on to the final section of this video where I'm going to talk about scribing and one other improvisational technique I've had to use. I had two issues with this floor. Firstly, a convex bulge in the floor on one side of the room. And in this situation, if you have got a bit of a bulge in the floor, you need to remove the bulge from the skirting board itself. This was essential if I was going to get my skirting board to sit flush with the floor at its far end. I did this by marking with a pencil where all the boulders were and then carefully removing them gradually with my old vintage block plane. It's a lovely little tool this and I advise you to get one yourself. A link to my previous video is coming up on the screen now. But be careful and keep your hands above the bed of the plane. A freak injury on this job around about now left me with a 20 millimeter splinter in my thumb for over a week whilst I was filming today's video. A lesson to us all to be careful even when using innocuous tools like this. I was in a lot of pain while that splinter worked its way out. I'm glad it did, as the NHS in the current lockdown situation would not have thanked me for going into hospital with that. With any scribing process, you need to be a little bit patient and you offer the skirting up several times to get all the contours accurately scribed as you gradually get the skirting down to the position it needs to be in. But it's well worth doing because eventually I was able to remove all of the bulges and to get the skirting sitting flush with the floor. The second issue I had was with a concave sagging of the floor on the other side of the room, which left me more than a finger's width gap between the skirting and the floor. And if you're wondering why my floor is so chaotic, you've only got to take a look at the floor joists before I laid the new floor. In this situation, you obviously can't take anything off the skirting boards themselves, because if you did, there'd be a mismatch between the skirting board and the next skirting board connecting to it at each end. And no amount of force in the middle could lower the skirting board down. So I ended up with a solution of placing a single mitre saw cut in the skirting at each point where it needed to be lowered. It took just enough of the guts out of the skirting to give it the flexibility to be pushed down, eliminating the gap. It was then just simply a case of gluing the cuts with a PVA wood filler, screwing them into position with the tongue tight screws and the Fisher Duo power plugs, and then filling the cuts with my two part wood filler. And whilst we're talking about filler, as I said earlier, the beauty of these lost tight screws is that filling is minimal and sanding each pair of screws takes under 10 seconds. So that's it for today. I hope that will make sense and that you found it useful. If you did, then it'd be great if you could click on the like button below. Don't forget, details of all the tools and the processes that I've been through today will be in the description below the video, which obviously you can access by clicking on the little arrow on your smartphone or the show more button on your PC. In the description section, you'll find a link to my PayPal donate page. It would be amazing if you could give me just a pound or two as it helps me to keep creating this free content. Stay tuned, in my next video, I think I'm gonna talk about corking these skirting boards, particularly given the issues I had with that large gap. So I think it might make for quite an interesting video. And if you're new to my channel, as I always say, I would absolutely love to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here. See you soon.